Okay, colleagues, I think we can start. So welcome everyone. This is actually a very exciting moment for, for us, for the Women's Working Group on FFD. We, uh, as you know, we are organizing this series of, um, of webinars on macro solutions for women, the people and the planet. It's a series of action-oriented dialogues that we were thinking that are crucial to have in relation to the macro agendas that are deeply ingrained with the origins of the current crisis as well as the unfolding of it. So this is why we thought it was very important to convene um, all of us as feminists and uh, activists in, in global platforms to, to try to dig deep into what are the challenges and what are the solutions. So as uh, one of the co-conveners of the Women's Working Group on FFD, we are thrilled to, to have you all here. I just wanna say that uh, we had a first dialogue with UN officers from the FFD office and uh, UN women. It was amazing and we had also the voice of, of, uh, of uh, feminist activists as well. But this is really the first webinar with, that is really composed of, of activists, feminist activists. To me, it's like uh, my rock stars and you will see how we have a lineup of concerts with really rock stars that we serve. Uh, uh, all of our admiration. Um, so to me, it's like I'm, I'm even eager to ask them for their, their, their autograph because it's really amazing the thing that they're doing on the ground. And in this today, you will see the, the, the level of analysis paired up with the, the impetus and the drive to, to transform on the ground every day. So this is really an honor as well to, to be moderating the session. I want to say that the Women's Working Group has been working on the financing for development issues since, um, since uh, in preparation for the, for the Doha conference. And uh, from then on, we were also organizing and trying to facilitate the participation of women from all around the world and the feminist organizations for the Addis Ababa uh, conference. And um, so this is also a way in which we can gather up and try to make a collective reflection so I just want to introduce my other colleague, the, from, Rosa Lizarde from the Feminist Task Force, who's uh, the other co-convener of, the, of, the, of these uh, webinars, because she's uh, also facil been facilitating and one of the founders of the Women's Working Group on FFD. So Rosa, I just wanted to, so th that you say hi to the people. Thank you, I just want, thank you, Emilia. I just want to say thank you to our panelists. Thank you to Eurodad. This was a great partnership. It's wonderful that we're able to do this uh, in the second webinar. Um, we're very happy. So thank you, Lidi, Patricia, and Yolanda. And take it away, Emilia. Thank you, all of you, for joining. Thank you. And uh, so in this case, this second uh, webinar, we are organizing it alongside Eurodad. So thank you so much for this. We are trying to to partner with uh, the members of the Women's Working Group to, to really have this as a, as a collective initiative. So we want to thank Eurodad in, in organizing this, this webinar in, the, in drafting the, the main foundation of, of this conversation. But really, we also want to thank uh, Latindad for joining us and the, the Asian People's Movement on Debt and Development because uh, they are here as well uh, joining us. So the, I wanted to say some things before we start up. As you will see, we will have translation in Spanish. So we thank very much the interpreters uh, for starters. And I want to give some information on how to do it. If you see below on your screen, there is a little globe that reads interpretation. So if you click it, you click on it, you will see how you will have the option on English, Spanish or have it uh, off. So if you want, you can, have um, interpretation into Spanish. So, para las personas que quieren traducción al español, pueden oprimir en el globito que dice interpretación y allí van a tener las opciones de estar apagado inglés y español. Entonces, pueden usarlo a lo largo de toda la sesión. Uh, I also want to let you know that this session will be recorded. It's for, for, for purposes of future dissemination. I just wanted to let you know and uh, for those of you who don't want to, to, to be on the recording, feel free to send us comments through the chat and uh, we will make sure that they, these reach the, the panelists. 
So uh, just as, as a background for this, um, for this webinar, um, from my end, you know, I'm, I'm a feminist, I'm wearing my, my I am my feminist uh, vision. Um, I am a feminist and I think, and I'm from Mexico, so I really am convinced that this issue on debt is totally entrenched in, in and rooted in colonialism, in the very long tradition of uh, an imposition of some peoples over others. And we are seeing now how the, the very negative impacts of that on white supremacy is really taking a toll on, on many of, uh, of our groups of population all around the world. The, the uprising in the US and other white countries is just, I think, a, a signal that the extent of that white supremacy and that colonial impact uh, is being felt all around the world, even in, in those uh, imperialist countries. But uh, why am I saying this? Because that was also uh, uh, starting when, when countries decided to, to get their independence and as a condition for the imperialists to leave. They, they impose these, these debts that are running up, up until now. As you know, this scandalous um, figure in the UK about, about how they just finished paying the, the, the traffickers of slaves in 2015, the debts that they acquired with the traffickers, they just finished to pay that. And, and that is paid with our, with our um, taxes. And that, that is just an example in the UK, which is a developed country and their relation to their own history of colonialism. So I just wanted to highlight how this, this is really rooted as a systemic problem in the history of the world and in the config, global configuration. And uh, this is why just for the sake of justice and global justice, this is a feminist issue, but we will see with our, with our panelists how uh, the, our feminist analysis goes deep and we have proposals, we have suggestions, and we have a lot to do in this current uh, pandemic. So I just wanted to highlight that as, a, as my feminist start, but you will see uh, all of our, our panelists will go into different angles. So I, I'm going to go with each of you each of our panelists and introducing you and then um, feel free to, to, to bring us all of your expertise and for the audience my suggestion will be that we leave our three panelists speak. We will have plenty of time to have a live conversation with them and this is why uh, we will I will be trying to moderate to have a um, um, a very accessible dialogue with, with you as the audience and, and our amazing speakers. So we're going to start with uh, Yolanda Fresnillo, who's also been a very close partner in organizing this, so we thank you for that, uh, Yolanda. Uh, Yolanda is a policy and advocacy officer at Eurodad on the justice. She's also a sociologist, a feminist and activist on the deaf movement since the late 1990s. She's the main author of the Eurodat research out of service, how public services and human rights are being threatened by the growing debt crisis, focusing as well on gender impacts on unfurling uh, debt crisis. Yolanda, I just want to start with you on, on a question that is uh, perhaps more uh, very interesting to us, like uh, why, why is this a matter for concern for the feminist movement? And is there a feminist way to approach the, the analysis on that and the current, uh, on the one hand, analysis on that and the macro challenges, and on the other, how is that connected to, to our analysis of the, of the current pandemic that we're seeing and the overall response to it? So over to you, Yolanda. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Emilia and, and Ross and the Women's Working Group on FFD uh, for uh, co-organizing this. When we saw you were planning something on debt and gender that we have had in mind for a long time in, in Eurodad, uh, we didn't add a second to uh, ask for organizing it together. And I hope this is uh, not the first, but one in many uh, actions uh, together. Uh, why debt is a, is a feminist issue and, and why uh, feminist movement should be involved in uh, the fight to abolish uh, illegitimate debts and, and, uh, and sustainable debts. Um, it's 
I think it's a question that answers themselves itself because of what you just said about uh, the actual debt crisis being rooted in colonialism, neo-colonialism, the financialization uh, process, uh, and how the, the patriarchal system is actually uh, interlinked with all those uh, processes. Um, but I'm, I'm going to focus more on what we are living uh, today, which, as, as, as I say, it's, uh, it's a consequence of, of uh, those processes. Uh, we, before the, the pandemic, we were living an unprecedented increase of uh, debt levels globally, not only in the global south, also uh, in Europe or uh, in, in, in other uh, economies. Uh, according to the World Bank, which is not our main reference, but they were they, they agree with us that it, this was the largest, the fastest, and the most broad based increase in debt in uh, emerging and developing economies, as they call them. Uh, from previous crises, we know that uh, spiraling public debts mean that public budgets are, are bearing an increased weight of debt service. So if you increase your debt, you have to pay. Uh, more interest and more uh, debt services in general, uh, and this consequently have a, an increased uh, pressure over the budget over the different budget lines, including uh, basic services. Uh, we published this report out of service uh, last February, showing how debt between uh, 2010 and 2018 external debt uh, payments uh, were increasing as a percentage of uh, government revenues, uh, it went on average from 6% to more than 12% uh, in less than uh, eight years, uh, meaning that more and more parts of the portions of this uh, government revenue was going to be devoted to paying the debt service, meaning there is less money uh, for, uh, for public services. Uh, and as we know, reducing resources uh, to deliver public services means that there is less uh, gender sensitive uh, public services. We know that this means um, that there is uh, less services specifically addressed for women, uh, especially uh, services on, on gender viol violence, uh, on, on prevention and on uh, attention for uh, women victim of uh, gender violence. Uh, on um, on healthcare, on maternal care, uh, schools, uh, etc. We know that, uh, and we have seen this in, in, in this crisis, that this increasing debt uh, and the push uh, for austerity measures and for uh, privatization has led, for example, uh, the different countries less fit to address the health crisis, the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic that we have uh, now, there is a clear overlap between uh, increasing debt and um, increasing vulnerability on public health, uh, for instance. This is only one, an example, one of the examples we could say the same about uh, education, water provision, uh, et cetera. The neoliberal austerity doctrine that uh, accompanies uh, this debt increase, not only by the uh, imposition of uh, conditionalities or uh, policy advice by the World Bank or the IMF or other IFIs, but also because uh, central governments adopt this, um, this doctrine as the only way uh, forward when they address, when they face that distress has meant also uh, budget cuts on, on public workers and, and wage caps. Uh, this also has an impact on, on, on women. Um, and, and an increase in, <coughs> in non-paid uh, care work. Um, I, I could uh, go for more than 10 minutes only uh, by describing all, this, all these interlinkages. But I will uh, just quote uh, a sentence by uh, GADN and, and FEMNET that I think it's very, it's very clear. Uh, they say the availability of women's unpaid care as a shock absorber is the premise on which cuts to public services are based. So this debt increase uh, leads to public services because they know they can do these cuts because it's women who will bear the cost and bear uh, the extra uh, work that will result 
from, from that. The situation is even worse now after the, the COVID. Debt levels are rising because most of the financing is being made, the, the, this emergency financing is being made uh, with, uh, with loans, uh, but also because uh, mm, revenue uh, is uh, decreasing because of the decrease uh, in exports, in, uh, in commodity prices, in tourism, in remittances, and, as, and, and of course, because of the record capital, capital flight that developing countries are, are, are seeing. Um, what, what should we do with, uh, with this situation? The offers being made by the G20 and IMF, and we could go into detail uh, afterwards, uh, have fallen far short of uh, what is needed uh, for uh, Global South countries to face the global and economic uh, crisis. The, the G20 debt relief, for instance, is just a temporary suspension. It's not, a not even a cancellation. It only covers a small group of countries. Uh, it does not imply participation of private creditors or multilateral development. Uh, banks and uh, if we don't want this situation to become a new wave of uh, not only debt but uh, austerity and, and, and cuts we should call for this uh, immediate debt cancellation of debt payments and for more comprehensive and long-term approach to the debt crisis resolution uh, to, to put in place a framework for uh, for resolving the debt crisis in a in a way that is fair uh, that is lasting uh, that it includes all the countries based on the needs of those countries and when when i say need i i mean uh, human rights uh, guarantee including women's uh, rights uh, and even protecting those countries that are uh, use their sovereign right and duty to protect uh, human rights and decide not to pay. Those countries in the global south who, who today uh, might decide, well, we will protect our people before the creditors and decide not to pay, will face litigation in international courts by vulture funds and, uh, and, and investors. And that is something that uh, needs to be uh, uh, circled. <coughs> And, uh, and I will uh, finish with, with that, and we can go more into detail if there are questions. Uh, one of the things we are also proposing is uh, to take this opportunity to uh, develop a new approach to debt sustainability uh, for the IFIs, for the creditors, even from the, for, for, for uh, some of the uh, borrowers. Uh, debt sustainability means uh, if there is enough money to pay regardless of if that money should be better invested in protecting human rights or protecting women's uh, rights or protecting uh, the people. We need a new approach to debt sustainability that uh, takes into account uh, environmental needs, climate emergency, human rights, and uh, of course, uh, gender uh, justice. Uh, and this is something that could be debated and developed together uh, from the feminist movement and uh, the, the debt movement. I will leave it to there. I have a longer <laughs> presentation, but since uh, you said 10 minutes, I think uh, uh, I'll leave it here. Thank you so much, Yolanda. You're right on time, and we look forward to hearing your next round of, of comments once we are interacting with the, with the audience. Um, this is really interesting because also people always think about macro agendas as it were in a sphere very far away from them, but you're really making the connection on how, yes, those macro issues that are very big dynamics and that it seems like, oh, this is a global issue. Why do I need to take care, take care of this now when I have more pressing urgent at the national level? But we see how this is impacting directly at the national level and the inability of, of the governments to address the, the let us say the also the multi-level needs that the population is having at this moment. So this is a, a great starter for us and definitely uh, is an issue that we feminists need to keep on on, on paying attention to. We're gonna go to Patricia Miranda. Patricia is a global advocacy director at Latin Dat. She works on debt on global and regional levels, coordinating inputs from its member organizations along three countries in the region. And she has an expertise at regional, national, and subnational levels. 
Um, she's part of the CSO Financing for Development Group, member of the steering committee of the Civil 20, and chair of the Financial Transparency Coalition. Um, I will say Patricia is also one of the most uh, uh, featuring stars in the Latin American region. Uh, she's one of the a key actor, uh, and uh, she's a leader for us as well in, in how to, to move forward in, in addressing these challenges. So it is also a, a huge pleasure to have Patricia here. Patricia, I wanted to ask you, uh, I'm going a bit in depth of, um, on some of the things that Yolanda already brought up to the table. What are the concerns for developing countries? How is this uh, affecting them directly? And uh, um, already uh, Yolanda started to mention something about private lenders. I think people is used to hearing about IFIs and the, the international financial institutions, but from th this other aspect, could you also explain to us what is the role that private lenders are, are having uh, in this current situation, and if you would have any any thoughts on what systemic ch changes do we need to promote uh, from a feminist perspective? So go ahead, Patricia. Thank you very much, Emilia, and very glad to be part of this uh, great panel and initiative. I would like to start um, first to, to uh, bring in uh, a few more linkages on depth and gender from uh, the, the, the work we do uh, in, in our region. And in the moment that a loan is originated, uh, women's needs are not taken into account. Uh, for instance, uh, loans or debt basically uh, in, in southern regions has prioritized infrastructure, financing infrastructure, but these are not loans aimed to finance care infrastructure to allow uh, a, a redistribution of non uh, remunerated work hours from women to the public sector or to men. Uh, another point is that um, debt resources are not uh, addressing to raise uh, competitiveness in sectors such as agriculture or uh, micro, small and medium enterprises where women's work uh, is strongly represented. And lastly, uh, that is aimed to keep the dependence, especially in, in our region, in Latin America, uh, to, to keep the dependence on extractive industries, which we know it does not benefit directly to women. So uh, having, having put that uh, idea in, in, on, on the table, because that, that's a, a policy that has been going through many decades when we talk about a debt, what was the situation before COVID? Some developing countries were in debt distress or even close to a debt default in several regions. Uh, debt risks were already higher before COVID and that uh, movements and, and civil society organizations that work on that were uh, prompting this in every uh, advocacy space we had about um, the future risks of debt in the world and which countries hated the problem. As well, the I don't know if you hear me. I, I can. I, I'm receiving a, a, a strange message here. Yeah, you froze well, a bit. Uh, that, I'm hearing you. Okay, thank you. Well, in addition, uh, that has a different land, landscape than the landscape we had uh, decades ago. We have not only the traditional external debt, but we have domestic debt, uh, private debt, external corporate debt. Uh, state-owned enterprises and new risks as public-private partnerships. Some countries, as Yolanda mentioned, have high debt service projections for the next years, which of course undermines social investment. Some countries are already implementing their own fiscal adjustments without even having a program with the IMF, which of course has impacts especially on social investment. That usually has more impact on women as well as the austerity measures policies that have been already mentioned. And in general, with the scarce possibilities from our countries to really increase domestic resource mobilization under a progressive approach. 
So that was happening before COVID. Now, with the pandemic, as I said, uh, the crisis, multiple, a multiple crisis has accelerated and arrived to our countries. So in, the, in the, our current uh, short-term needs under COVID is uh, the developing countries need urgently resources to first finance lockdowns, especially considered many southern countries have a big informal sector, which is overrepresented by women who earns incomes on a day-to-day -day basis and in most cases are heads of household. And second, to improve we need resources to improve our precarious health systems, which is uh, a, a, which flaws and, and weaknesses are being carried by women and their no remunerated care work. And with this crisis, we can see, I think all can see more than ever that the care economy is holding the sustainability of life during this crisis. The current solutions that the global community is offering. Now, in our view, are basically traditional options, <clears throat> basically new debt, new loans, not really under concessional terms, no grants, uh, few grants, suspension of debt service for the poorest countries, as was mentioned, which in overall, it's not really a solution. It's not enough resources and it's just a postponement of the problem that in the path will increase inequality gap. The recession is global and at no, under a no precedent scale. Middle income countries are hardly hit, not just by the pandemic, but as I said, by a multiple crisis and the recovery will be longer um, harder and painful, painful for developing countries. So in that view, our proposals are that we need immediate and permanent debt service cancellation from multilateral, bilateral and private lenders. This is not the same debt cancellation as we had in the past, if you remember HIPIC or MDRI. It's this, this is a, a, a different approach and we can go further on this and in the Q&As. Um, there is a challenge within all type of creditors and as uh, Emilia asked, I, I would uh, make an emphasis on private creditors, which currently it's, um, they're being asked to do it under a voluntary basis and under conditions that are certainly putting creditors' interest first in the methodology and the calculations uh, they are uh, putting their interest first, that they're not going to lose any cent. And as uh, civil society organizations, it's important that we start to, it has been done in, in, in different times, but I think we can do it all together now and with more strength to directly criticize the principles of the Institute of, fin of International Finance, the IIF, and start to, uh, to put the finger in that processes, in that in that principles and in that proposals. Because then again, it's just to postpone the problem, but not address it in the benefit of uh, the, the poorest and the most hit and vulnerable population. Um, a second proposal is that it's not um, whether a, a, a debt uh, service cancellation takes place uh, this is a huge crisis with no precedents, and we have heard this in, in, in every space. Uh, but so this will not be enough. Um, our uh, developing countries' uh, policies are not comparable with the huge stimulus packages as developed countries are putting in place. So it's important that uh, developing countries have access to grants or to no cost resources and with no conditionalities involved. So among our proposals on this, besides the cancellation, is uh, to uh, have access to new and fresh resources. Uh, this, the, an issuance of a special drawing rights from the IMF, which is not in form of debt, uh, but it's 
to be allocated to the IMF members that actually need it. So it's um, an issuance as it was it, as it happened in 2009 with the global financial crisis, where um, this allocation has been uh, this this issuance has been allocated to IMF uh, country members. Uh, our proposal in this is that besides that could take place, it would be important to have a reallocation of these resources. So developed countries that don't need these resources because they have already their own stimulus packages can transfer their special drawing rights, uh, these rights to developing countries that actually need very much these resources. This doesn't involve an, an IMF program, therefore it's, it doesn't involve a conditionality. It's not a, a debt because the, the, uh, the capital is not repaid, only a few interest rate of 0.05%. And it would be actually mean a fresh resources to face this multiple crisis, to use, it as a, to use it as a budget support, not as a balance of payments. And in, in, in the long term, it's important to keep an eye also in the long term. Why to, to, to be more specific in the short term? Because the policies and measures that are being taken now as new loans and a new wave of loans will have, of course, uh, impacts in the middle and long term. But before COVID, we have already a debt monster growing. So it's important to keep an eye on the long term proposals as uh, to having um, a debt sustainability assessment that uh, specifies and analyzes the new, land, the new land debt landscape that I mentioned, uh, that contributes to an SDG approach, and, at a, and to have a change of concept. Currently, um, according to the IMF, debt sustainability is uh, when a country can, uh, can repay their, their debt without having to uh, renegotiate or restructure that debt. We think that uh, debt is sustainable if the payment of the repayment of that credit is not affecting the social protection investment. So I, it's important to have that change now. That would uh, contribute to, to... Two minutes. Thank you. That would contribute to avoid a high debt service burden over social investment. And it would also contribute to the civil society and to, to women to have, a, to have a citizenship surveillance on that for not uh, to avoid needing, to avoid to get to a point where we desperately need a debt restructuring process to give time alerts, timely, uh, timely alerts. And the, the second long-term issue is uh, the debt restructuring process. I'm not going further on that because Yolanda already mentioned. So um, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Patricia. So many things to say. I just wanted to say, um, perhaps later on with, with the question and answers, uh, people will be uh, able to address uh, the, the different points of entry they want. To, to hear more of, but I'm just, uh, I just wanted to highlight how this relates to our demand for governance and especially a democratic governance at the UN, because as we see, for instance, on this issue on, on private lenders, they're absolutely willing to, to send a lawsuit against our, our developing countries and that, that will be also a very pressing issue to deal with. But the other that is related to what we will see in another of our webinars is how IFIs especially the Bretton Woods institutions, are imposing a very uh, decadent view on development, on imposing conditionalities, on, on, on reducing social expenditure and on. And so this is why I, I'm already going back to my, my proposition on how this is totally rooted in a colonial dynamic. Those that are powerful imposing uh, still uh, those rules that are Keep on, keep on extracting from, from our developing countries. And um, so, well, with this, I just wanted to invite really one of my most uh, admired and dear feminists in the world. Uh, this is uh, Livin Napsil. We've met in so many battles together and uh, it's always a pleasure to, to see her. Lidi, um, 
As you know, Lidi is the uh, regional coordinator of the Asian People's Movement and Debt and Development, and also vice president of the Freedom uh, from Debt Cancellation in the Philippines. And uh, really, uh, Lidi, it's a pleasure to have you here. So uh, perhaps you can touch a bit further on, on these things that Yolanda and Patricia already started to mention about the role of IFIs, uh, the implications for women, and perhaps um, if you can go deeper on these issues on governance and financial architecture, what are uh, the challenges and what would be our feminist uh, demands on that respect? So Lidi, go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to speak with Yolanda and Patricia. And I must say that I'm very happy to be with them because we've known each other and worked together on this issue for uh, close to two decades now, huh? um, since the Jubilee days in 1999 and the year 2000. And we've learned a lot from each other over the years and it's good to be you know, in fighting form again on the debt issue. Um, I'm very happy that Emilia, you also uh, raised the issue of debt as a colonial legacy, because it's very important for us to understand the history of the debt so that we can have a, you know, a, a sharper understanding of what it takes to solve this problem you know, strategically and not to have just you know, temporary short-term stopgap measures. Um, I think the fact that it's a, the, the fact that with almost no exception, the first lenders to our countries in the South were our colonial powers, speaks of that legacy, you know, as, as you said. From that very beginning and up to today, I think uh, our experiences today bear out the fact that a lot, most of these uh, lending and borrowing transactions are really primarily in the interest of the lenders rather than the borrowers. And that's one of the mainstream uh, narratives that we need to challenge because they always tell us today, you know, we are lending to the South because you need the money, you need capital, you don't have enough money in the South, there's a lot of poverty, and therefore we're going to lend to you. And that for us, we know by our own experience is hardly the truth, that in most cases, the lending is in their interest and especially this is shown in uh, how they call, uh, how they define a debt crisis. And uh, as you said, Mexico, from where you come from, Emilia, is, that's a very historical uh, country because the first debt crisis they called in, in modern history is when Mexico started to default, I think in 1981 maybe or 82, I don't remember exactly what year now, but we've we followed pretty soon after that the Philippines. And uh, I'm mentioning this because the very way they uh, define debt crisis is when the borrowers are not able to pay in full what is due, borrowers are not able to pay on time. And that for them is a debt crisis. That's how uh, it's very much in the uh, vantage point or the perspective of the lenders but if you take the vantage point of the borrowers of the people who are affected by the debt are people in the south and now no longer just people in the south but also people in europe you now in the countries that are uh in the, in the eurozone or the euro debt crisis uh from the point of view of our people it's a perennial crisis it's a permanent crisis because the debt has always been very much affecting our lives as people and and part of the crisis that we experience every day is caused by this very problem um i I'd, I'd like to also mention another important part of the dominant narrative that we need to challenge uh that is part of this this narrative about you know the lending is in the interest of the south because we need the money we also need to be able to say the truth that if you look look at the net financial flows, taking into consideration everything, trade, lending, and everything, the net flows are from the south to the north. You know? It means we create a lot of wealth in the south. The problem is we're not able to keep it because the structural relations are such that the wealth flows from our countries to the south you see that in trade you see that in extraction you see that in lending because we pay a lot in terms of interests 
And if you put all of that together, that's what the figures will, will tell all of us, that the flows, in fact, the wealth is coming from the south to the north. And that's one of the things we need to challenge, especially if you put it in historical context, if you look at the historical and ecological debts, that's something that we've always also been raising uh, in contrast to the financial debts that we supposedly owe the international lenders, the northern lenders, we are owed much more than what we supposedly owe them in terms of that long history of plunder. And when others tell you, well, that's history, that's already passed. If you look at the net flows today, that is still part of, uh, that, that history is still constantly being uh, made and, and recreated even in current relations. So one of the things we're saying is that we don't, we cannot only address the outstanding debt. That's only part of the problem. And even with a series of debt cancellations, there's always an accumulation and a reaccumulation of this debt. And that will happen unless we change the entire system, unless we change the financial system, and unless we change the fact that this financial system has been has become even more dominant than what they call is the real economy. No? So it has a logic of its own. Money makes money. It has almost no relationship with the act with actual production and production of goods and services and 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 i that's part of what yolanda has mentioned as financialization so we need to take a more systemic approach i'm not i'm not discounting the need for debt cancellation that is a very urgent need but we need to take also a more strategic and systemic approach so that we can once and for all end the problem of uh, the debt. So we're hoping that this uh, crisis is going to be an opportunity for us to reassert some of the more strategic uh, processes and parts of the solutions that we have been asserting for a long time. Um, we need to be able to uh, set the course for a review of these debts. You know, we have called for debt audits, for instance, for many years, and we need to renew that call again so that this process can be a process for people to have a better understanding of how these debts were created and what are the solutions and the more systemic solutions to address them. Um, I'd just like to end with, you know, just a little bit more kind of adding to how women are affected by all of this and maybe just to put it in a little bit more uh, summary. Um, the debt affects us in different layers of dimension, different layers and dimensions. The first, which Yolanda and Patricia has also elaborated on, is how it has affected public services. And that has affected women because of our traditional roles in the care economy. Yolanda has spoken about how we absorb what cannot be provided by government, by services, how we are we have to absorb as women the care that we need to that our families need when the government is not able to provide and we cannot afford to access it through market because it has become very expensive it has been privatized it has been commercialized and we see that now very stark during the COVID-19 crisis, no? it's not just those who get sick from COVID-19, those who get sick from any other uh, illness or disease are not able to receive the healthcare they need because of the severe pressures it has on the public health system. You, you don't even want to go to the hospital because they turn you away. They cannot handle anything, not, not COVID-19 and not any other disease. So we, people, are at home and women absorb everything. The second is it affects economies, the debt affects economies. And when there's severe economic pressure, women are affected the most because we bear several layers of that disadvantage as women, as workers, and, and as being part of families which feel the pressure of the, of the economic crisis and the relationship that has to to the rise of domestic violence. That is what women are talking about in communities. Their husbands are home during the quarantine period. And there's a lot of pressure in the family and domestic violence has really risen in these times, during these times. 
we are also affected not just by the debt service, we're also affected by the projects that are financed through loans and the conditionalities that come with these loans. So there's a lot of stories to tell what kind of projects are being financed by, by loans. So we need not just to look at the aggregate amounts of debt service and debts owed, we need to look at what projects have been financed by debts. Um, and I guess just to wrap up, I know I probably have taken more time than I should. Um, we really are very challenged to take on this issue again, but make sure also that we relate it with a call for a reboot and a rebuilding of the economy not just to solve the crisis of the system now, but to take advantage of the situation so that we can begin to rebuild economies away from what we have today, the system that we have today. We don't want to recover in the same kind of system. We want to, we want to take advantage of this situation to call for a major shift away from the current system that we have today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lydia. Actually, you were not only right on time, but you were spot on in everything you said. Um, I'd say uh, we, we have this challenge, as you mentioned, um, in following the proposals that our previous speakers uh, said about addressing this in, a, in an urgent manner, but what are the long-term measures, measures, but also the systemic uh, interrelations to, to the other um, let us say struggles that we're fighting in the economic justice uh, dimension so that we are really having a comprehensive approach and not necessarily trying to fix it only from technical point of entry but really trying to see this this whole dynamic um wealth flowing from the south to the north and i will just go I, i'd say there are so many elements that the three of you mentioned but just to wrap up and open the door the floor to, to the audience is how the care economy is a shock absorber on the one hand, and so countries rely on, on, on the care economy as, okay, I'm gonna add more pressure on it, I'm gonna withdraw more, it doesn't matter, women are gonna be there with their elasticity in time and in unpaid domestic and care work production, so it's like it doesn't matter, add more to that. And um, the other, in this is very much closely linked to the dynamic of conditionalities and austerities that are have been imposed by the by the international uh, financial institutions and it's like they don't hear they don't hear how we keep on calling for human rights for uh, gender equality for environmental criteria and they keep on adding on the same recipe despite even uh, un human rights rapporteur telling them this is this has to stop and the worrisome thing is that despite that those warnings we had in the past saying we are having we are in the face of a huge economic and financial crisis coming from illicit financial flows and coming from debt uh, crisis and no one listened and we are here now all uh, as well facing a huge pandemic and rumor has it from FAO a very likely uh, famine. So this is the situation in which we are at and that, that uh, solutions and proposals that are, as uh, Patricia was mentioning, more on the loan, on the side of loans rather than on grants and uh, to really reject conditionalities that are imposing reduction on this ability of the population to, to recover and really to give um, a feel for resource domestic mobilization for ensuring human rights as a whole. So I'm gonna stop here. Um, so thank you so much for our, our, our speakers. They just gave us so much to discuss. So there is, I will propose, there is a question here addressed uh, for Yolanda on the relation on, well, on language on the 2015 Truth Committee on the Greek Public Debt, which has a definition on, on sustainable debt in relation to debt and human rights. So perhaps you can go uh, in depth on that. And, uh, but I will also open, um, I will open this question to the three of you, if you want, uh, if you have something to say about it, because it's, it tackles on the, the very definition of a problem, what is unsustainability of debt, 
on the one hand, and then after that, we will go to, to see what are the, the other uh, notions that our audience is feeling uh, that are crucial to, to address from a feminist point of view. So I will open this question to the three of you because I'd say uh, it has many of the elements that you, you mentioned, uh, but Yolanda, you, you go first. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's in fact uh, a very good question. Uh, when when the different countries uh, have um, started debt processes, debt audit processes, uh, one of the questions is what are we auditing? Uh, if we are auditing debt legitimacy, illegitimacy, but also debt sustainability, not in the way the IMF and the World Bank does with their debt sustainability analysis, that is done, that is a technical analysis on, on payment capacity, which is normally which is normally not taking in account all the issues that they should take in account when analyzing uh, paying capacity. Um, but if we understand uh, that a debt isn't sustainable as uh, the Truth Committee on the uh, Greek Public Debt defined, uh, when, when the government, when the borrower state does not have the capacity to fulfill its basic human rights obligations, uh, relating healthcare, education, water, sanitation, or adequate housing. Uh, yeah, this is, this, I mean, if, if we could include those elements into the debt sustainability concept, that would be uh, putting a, a gender perspective and a feminist perspective into debt sustainability somehow. Um, and, and, and I think uh, the question asks if some steps have been done in this sense and if we have. Uh, received uh, any answers uh, on this by the institutions. I think the institutions are uh, willing to engage in a debate on that sustainability, but not on these terms, probably. Uh, more in, in how can, can they improve uh, this uh, assessment on, on, on payment capacity. And for instance, the IMF has done some steps on including in their uh, debt assessment, debt sustainability assessment, uh, climate vulnerabilities, not big steps, small small steps, but they have they are willing to include uh, some of those. Uh, probably not from a feminist perspective. When we see how the IMF, for instance, is uh, is I would say trying, but maybe that's too generous, trying to include a gender perspective into their uh, work, they only see women as a uh, possible workers. I mean, they, they think uh, including a gender perspective is only and, and, and only uh, opening possibilities for women to get into the paid labor market. That's, that's the only role that they, uh, they, they see uh, for us. They, they, don't, they don't recognize, they don't really recognize uh, the care economy. They say they do. They say they take into account, but when they do the analysis, it's not, uh, it's not there. And when they do the policy recommendations, that's not, uh, that's not there either. Um, one of the things I would say, and, I, and I'll finish with that, is that when we analyze this debt sustainability, uh, for example, with citizens' participation and with a feminist movement uh, participations, uh, if we should, it, that's a question more than a, uh, an, an affirmation. If we should take into account what uh, Lydia and Patricia mentioned on uh, what this debt was used for, what was funded with this uh, debt, which kind of projects have been funded and which kind of gender impacts uh, does this uh, project lending uh, had, uh, which is something that some of the debt audit processes, such as the one in Ecuador, um, got into account, which analyzed the gender impact of the of the uh, of the lending, and, and I'll, I'll leave it to the to Lydia and Patricia to complement. Thank you so much, but very very uh, rich elements to to keep on tacking on. Uh, so, uh, Patricia, you wanna say something about this? Thanks, Emilia. Well, Yolanda had a, a very uh, good approach. Uh, I, I would just like to add that uh, on the debt sustainability, as I read the question that was raised, um, 
Yes, the, it, it, the, the, the IMF assessment uh, looks at the capacity of repaying, but this is not uh, exhaustive enough, it's not complete. And from when we at the national levels analyze if we are able to repay that debt, our answer is usually no. But according to the IMF's assessment is, is yes. So that's why, we, why first we push for having a very a more exhaustive and complete uh, an analysis of that. And in addition, its uh, projections are over optimistic and that usually then have to be changed because that uh, didn't happen uh, in, in that optimistic way that was projected. Um, but that is with the IMF. But if we speak of other loans, if we speak of bilateral uh, lenders or uh, regional banks, uh, usually some of them, they don't even do this kind of analysis of the capacity of repayment. So that, that's even worse enough. That's even worse. And the other thing is how transparent is this and if citizens and if civil society in general is, is, is aware of, of, these, if, of these projections, if we, not only civil society, but even parliamentarians who are finally the ones that approve a credit, are they aware, do they have the enough information to know if a country is able to repay that debt in the future with no other optimistic projections? That is one thing. And the other is that there has been an in, in, incapacity, inability to link uh, these assessments with, uh, with development, with SDGs, or with national development plans. So it's completely one thing, the national development plan where uh, many people uh, takes part on, uh, to, to put inputs on with the gender approach and with uh, what do we want on, on our development. We don't want more infrastructure. We bought this idea that uh, southern countries have uh, an infrastructure gap, therefore we need more credits to fill that infrastructure gap. But there is a, like a, a separate thing to when we speak about a national development plans or the SDGs and how are we going to finance that. And, and it's important to make that, that to, to close that bridge because the financing policies to address that are actually increasing inequalities gap and and i think that's where we need to to put uh, our our finger on and well i think i will leave it there thank you thank you patricia and perhaps also adding to what you are saying this proposal on a debt workout mechanism that is not only addressing issue as issue and case by case right but really overseeing the encompassing, um, uh, let us say, dimensions or levels that uh, are in re relation to, to the debt crisis. Uh, Lidi, do you, do you want to comment on the question we received? It's on, in the chat of Q&A. Um, about the, the Chiara's question or Tete's question now. No, we are still on the, on the, on the definition on unsustainable debt. Unsustainability, okay. Yeah. Uh, of course, um, saying that sustainability should be uh, defined in terms of what can the country really afford without compromising the state's obligation to provide these services in full, no, not just in term in in minimal terms, but to provide all these essential services in full, and to be able to fulfill its obligations to towards all its citizens. Uh, in building an economy that actually provides for what is a humane and dignified life for all. Uh, of course, we will, we, it has been part of the uh, message of debt movements for a long time. But one of the important layers that we need to add to that is it's also not just simply a question of being able to pay with all these terms. It's also very much a question of should we even pay? No, so because we're talking about uh, public debts, we're talking about debts that were taken out in the name of people and debts being paid for by people's money. So it shouldn't be just a question of, well, can I afford to pay this? It should be a question of, why am I being paid to pay for debts that have financed projects that I haven't even benefited from? 
and when we say that um we also need to challenge also this kind of like uh, regular this uh, narrative part of the mainstream narrative that when there's a problem of the debt it's a problem of the debtors it's because the governments are corrupt because the governments uh borrowing governments wasted this money and so on that's true yeah but it's also true in many cases there are lender driven debts that were designed not really to uh, benefit the economy of the south but to benefit the economic the economies and to meet economic needs of the lending countries and there are example after another throughout history and even today that our countries were pedal debts and projects to be financed by debts that are not necessarily needed by our economies and at least of all our people so i think we need to put that also uh, as prominent as the question of what is this level of ability to pay that we're talking about we also need to talk about the justness of being made to pay for many of the debts that we didn't actually benefit from um, and I'd also like to say something about the problem of the debt, I guess, that leads us into some of the succeeding questions. Um, it's not just um, an impact on our economy, it's an impact on the power relations between the lending countries and the borrowing countries, between the lending institutions and the borrowing countries. And, you know, this is, for instance, a very uh, kind of like a... A very good example of this is the power that the IMF has on our economies and our countries on how it can actually, uh, we use the word dictate, but some are, some are saying, well, yeah, but some of our economic managers in our countries actually think along the same line. So it's a collusion yeah, between the IMF and those in our countries who are in power and think along the same neoliberal paradigm uh, that are running our economies, but you can't take away the fact that the IMF has that power. And part of that power is because of this international financial system that also looks to the IMF to be giving signals whether an economy and a government is doing well, is managing their economy well. And, th and oftentimes that means austerity measures so that they can pay their debts. Um, and so there's, there's this irony that many governments today, if offered debt relief, will refuse it because they fear that they will no longer be able to borrow heavily from the financial markets if they were known as beneficiaries of debt relief. We have heard governments say that. They, they, they're very wary of accepting debt relief because that is like acknowledging that they are in trouble. And to acknowledge that you are in trouble makes it very hard for you to borrow from the financial market. So they want to keep up this pretense that they're doing all right. Our government has refused debt relief at least three times in the last 15 years that it was actually offered, yeah? So it's, this is one of the things and, and that power in itself should be questioned. And it's, it's ridiculous, I think, for groups to think that we should use this power for instance, the power of the IMF to try to discipline our governments and our economy so that they should do the right thing. I think that's a, you know, a, a ridiculous idea that should be rejected. Well, thank you so much for this, Lydia, as well. It reminded me of a session that took place on the FFD uh, convening on COVID-19 in which the, I think about the World Bank who was calling for debt cancellation, but not on the IFI's loans because they said, because we will run out of money, so we should cancel all of the other debts, but not ours. And everybody's saying, yes, let's cancel all the debts, but, but the one on the other side and not ours. So what, what are the, the, the real implication on, on debt cancellation or as, as you are saying as well, when there are real possibilities on the table, uh, how is that perceived? And um, we, we seem that we are really digging in into the, the, the real challenges rather than just uh, having a, a general call, no? But, but this is what is behind what, what, 
what the activists on that have been asking all this time. So thank you for this. We have uh, three questions, so we can also, I'm gonna read them all and, um, and uh, do you decide which one do, do you want to, to respond? The first one is by Tete, hey Tete. Uh, she's asking uh, about what is your impression on a proposal by Chile to, to the, um, to the session held at the UNFCCC on, on youth momentum and climate change, because Chile was proposing that IMF should make green recovery a conditionality for loans. Oh, Jesus. Uh, so both all of the words that we don't like, uh, right, green and, and conditionality and loans. But it says like uh, these conditionalities like green jobs, just transition. And Chile even said that IMF should do some kind of structural adjustment program for green recovery. So what are your thoughts on this? This is one question. Another, uh, Maria Jose Albertino, uh, hello, Maria Jose. She's proposing uh, that we should pre prepare um, a document on death and human rights Actually, this is a good idea for the women's working group. We are gathering and compiling all this knowledge and trying to come up with summaries and, and specific papers. So we will take in, into consideration this proposal. And uh, but the question she is already posing to the panelists is: um, Do you have documents on or materials on this topic with concrete solution proposals that can be uh, shared with our governments? And we, as women's working group, we will be working on on advocacy materials, but uh, this is a good time if you want to share links with us as well uh, uh, so that we can send them to, to our audience. Gabi Ore Aguilar, hi Gabi. Uh, she's uh, thanking you all and asking, what have we learned from the 2018 crisis, eight about a crisis about debt and gender? And what should we, we be doing differently this time based on those lessons? Emma, Emma, we're so sad you're not with us uh, since the beginning, but um, she's saying that there's been some conversation about a feminist debt workout mechanism and what a feminist rating agency could look like. Oh, I love this question. So uh, I'm gonna stop here and then we're gonna have a second row of questions. This is very rich. So we, we love our audience as much as we love our, our speakers. So go ahead. I'm gonna start now in the uh, inverse order. So Lily, go ahead first. Uh, yeah, um, I started also answering uh, Tetet's question about the IMF uh, and using conditionality for countries to go on a green recovery. Well, first of all, um, as I said, why should we use the illegitimate power that IMF have, has over our countries in order to get our countries to do the right thing, if that's really even possible for the IMF to do that? I don't think any kind of economic program will work unless it's really driven internally by the countries and that and unless there's real genuine political will inside the countries if it's coming as conditionality it's not going to actually work and secondly it's really far off to even dream that the imf would actually be coming up with really good economic policies especially policies that will contradict what it has stood for since it was established you know, for more than, how old are they now? More than 60 years now. Um, and, you know, I, I think people who are going down that road are going to be really in for a very uh, ab ab abrupt, uh, I don't know, a shock that it's actually not going to work. And let's not waste even our time around that. Um, just uh, there's this last question that struck me and this is something that we haven't actually also uh, addressed enough and that is uh, the problem about the new forms of debt, new, relatively new, but for some countries it's been around for a long time and that's debts from the financial markets, that's through uh, the sale of bonds and securities. And the problem about that, it's a little bit more difficult to deal with in terms of solutions and measures because it's a very uh, fluid thing. So these debt papers can be sold and resold in the secondary markets. And oftentimes, this is what happens when the new borrowers buy the, pa the new uh, owners of the papers buy the papers on pennies to the dollar, as has been described, and then they sue in order for the government who issued the papers to pay them the full face value. So they make a lot of money, 
and in the process uh, that is you know exploiting the the suffering and the misery of the people in that country because then the government is going to be made to pay for those debts in full uh, so this is a, a big challenge for the debt movement how do we deal with debts through the that's uh, incurred through bonds and securities you can't just say oh we're not going to pay you don't even know who's holding the debt papers now and often we don't have any control or power in the debt markets so that's one of the things and one of the issues we have about that is we also need to prove to have preventative measures we can't just address them when the problems already come up so one of the issues here is our the over reliance of our governments in the financial markets for borrowing from the financial markets we need to stop that and we need to stop this business of over reliance on on borrowings which is again a legacy of how our economies has been built through through decades. Thank you so much, Lily, for this. Uh, we could listen to you all day. Uh, Patricia, what are your thoughts on the on the rich questions we received? Thanks, Amelia. Well, uh, really, in, indeed, ritual questions. I just would like to say on, on the green recovery, and this is a conversation uh, I had yesterday with several the colleagues that work on macroeconomics and gender, and we are still uh, wondering what exactly the IMF means about this, and what are the steps that it's not only it's not only saying, but we were really wondering, well, how are they proposing to do this? I would just stick with with um, an intervention that uh, uh, you had uh, Alicia Barcena from ECLAC uh, yesterday, and she said, well. We just don't want a green recovery. We want a multicolor recovery that has a gender approach. And uh, the steps towards this from um, global policy stakeholders, we have not seen yet. So I, I think it sounds good, but the, the policies that are being implemented to face this crisis are not reflecting that. Uh, regarding uh, what uh, documents on on these issues, well, from Latin that we are working on a depth and gender uh, report from uh, specifically uh, where we will add uh, our Latin American views on that. So we will share it when we have that prepared. But I, and on the other side, I take the, the advantage also to to share that uh, we are organizing as well a debt and gender uh, webinar uh, with a Latin American perspective, uh, along with uh, the women's uh, major group and other important networks and allies. So also please stay tuned for this. And there was a very interesting question about rating agencies. And yes, I think that in this crisis we can question what is the role of credit rating agencies? I mean, they are uh, downgrading uh, rates uh, uh, for developing countries under the current crisis. Um, and when we think about uh, developed countries that don't have a problem of fiscal space, that countries that can print their own money with no risks and no problems for their economies, and on the other side, there is a developing countries as, as our countries uh, that the, the, the main option they have now is to get more loans to address this crisis. We have already uh, discussed all the, 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 the relations and linkages between debt and gender. Um, in our case, Latin America is the most unequal region in the world. Uh, so the, based on this current system of uh, the current inequalities existing here and the direct impact on women of any economic policies under this unequal system, then any downgrade from a credit agency, rate agency to our countries is immediately to increase um, the interest rates. Several uh, Latin American countries, uh, because this is the information I have at hand, are already issuing, issuing sovereign bonds to face this crisis. Any downgrading from any rate, credit rate agency to our countries would, would imply to have an increased rate 
for those loans. And that immediately means that it will have a higher debt service, which a, a, a higher debt burden that has, that has the impacts that we already know, increasing inequalities, that countries, of course, will prioritize to repay those bonds instead of a guaranteeing uh, minimal social protection floors. And so that is the consequence of the role that credit agencies are having. And it's need to be, it, we need to put that more in the spot and, and say it more loud about this um, really a questionable role that they are having during this crisis. Thank you so much, Patricia. Um, uh, Yolanda, what, uh, what you, you have the, the question on the, on the feminist debt workout mechanism, the, uh, the lessons learned from the two, 2008 crisis, or uh, this issue on green uh, conditionalities. Yeah, on, 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 on this last issue, uh, yeah, I, I agree that we should be very careful on demanding for IMF conditionality. I, don't, I, I am among those who believe there is not such thing as post positive uh, conditionality because uh, it should be the country's sovereign right to decide uh, where to invest uh, their, their revenue. Uh, and it should be the people's right in each country to put pressure on their government for gender budgeting, for example, or for green budgeting, uh, but not the IMF from uh, up to, to, to bottom uh, imposing what to, um, where does the money has to be invested in, uh, especially because of the linkages and, and the the linkages of the IMF with the with the with the capital interest and the the, the, the multinational corporations and uh, the risk that this green recovery would mean business for the same people that have been doing business with the privatization of uh, the public services uh, and, and 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 fossil fuels uh, etc. So it would be. Uh, a bailing out of these uh, corporations, and and that's my my one of my worst uh, fears. I think this green uh, global green deal or care uh, new deal, as uh, Diane Nelson put it the other the other day, should come from bottom up, and uh, that's the only way we we can make sure it's a it's a fair proposal and not uh, something. Uh, to bail out uh, businesses as, as usual. Uh, I really like the idea of uh, a feminist rating agency. <laughs> I was just thinking we could, we could uh, rate on triple P of patriarchal uh, to different uh, government sovereign bonds or something like that. Yeah. Or triple F if there is uh, a, a nice uh, policy going on from a feminist point of view. Uh, but I think it could be a very nice um, communication action uh, together with uh, what is a most more serious proposal, which is a feminist debt workout mechanism. I think if there is a fair uh, resolution uh, for debt and, and, and if we push for a fair uh, mechanism to um, provide a fair debt resolution, it should be feminist. It, it, should, it should bear in mind, it should include uh, this feminist and gender perspective into it. Otherwise, it won't be a fair and transparent debt workout mechanism as we have been um, demanding for m m many years uh, now. Um, and it should be explicit. Uh, we should be very vocal within the debt movement that uh, there is no resolution to the debt crisis unless it is a feminist uh, resolution. Uh, what this sentence means, this is something we need to work on because we have the headlines and we have the analysis, but we need to have uh, the proposals. One of the things I, I was uh, reflecting on the other day was uh, we've been also pushing for uh, a binding, pr binding principles on uh, responsible lending and borrowing, uh, uh, following from all the debates and, and, and results 
in the UN and in the UNCTAD on, on the principles on uh, responsible lending, lending and borrowing. Uh, when we say this lending does not benefit women and, and, and does not benefit gender justice, are we saying that there is some kind of lending and some kind of financing uh, that uh, could be uh, gender responsive? And what characteristics does it have? What proposals do we have to our governments if they want to borrow from a feminist perspective? Does that exist? This, this is a debate that uh, we need to have and it needs to be uh, put on, uh, on our government's table. And I'm just gonna finish with uh, the question, I think it was from Maria Jose on, on if we have any document uh, to present to our governments. The, the report that we did at Eurodat previous to the COVID, uh, which is uh, on, on the debt crisis and public services has a final uh, page uh, on, on recommendations. And I think uh, this could be used and it was done with an explicit uh, gender perspective. Uh, but uh, also the statement signed by more than 200 organizations calling for a debt jubilee, for debt cancellation and new financing, general on debt, uh, it, it, this is something that the feminist movement, movement uh, could use. But I agree that maybe we could work together on a more specific uh, document on, on debt, uh, human rights, and, and specifically on, on women's rights and, and gender justice. I could go for one hour on what lessons learned from the 2008 crisis, but I don't think we have the time. So I'll, I'll go on for the next round or I don't know if we have much more time. Yeah, thank you. We have five minutes uh, left, but uh, first of all, thank you all. And uh, Lydi had to leave. She, she warned us that she, she was uh, going to jump into another webinar, but uh, so happy that we got her wisdom for a while with us. And uh, I just wanted to say, perhaps uh, I can read um, the, the next questions and you can just uh, make use of some of those elements to, to wrap up. And uh, just we want to uh, make an announcement that we will have a, a, a Spanish webinar organized in conjunction with Latindad, Eurodad and the Women's Working Group. And we will be working in more depth on, on Latin American cases. So maybe also many of these questions can be addressed there. And uh, so, okay, let us go through this. So Grove Harris, hi Grove. She's asking if can lenders be held responsible for predatory lending, maybe Puerto Rico, we can leave that to the Latin American case. And she's asking about the, the possibility of separating uh, public public uh, financing from private financing. And uh, Maria Jose is asking more, more specific issues on logistics, which I'll go back to. But if you want Patricia and Yolanda to give us some closing remarks, and if you want to, to tackle on, on these issues or, or general comments. And if you have a hashtag, we, we are very excited about hashtags now. Uh, I was thinking on the hashtag question, and uh, I think I think that the hashtag I, I just gave it before. Like, there is no solution to debt if not if, if it's not a feminist uh, solution. Uh, it's a, a bit too long for a hashtag, but uh, I think it might work. Um, on the questions. Um, Lenders can be held responsible for predatory uh, lending, but it's very difficult, lengthy, and, and costly. And uh, for instance, there is a very interesting process in uh, Mozambique, and uh, a couple of lenders have been uh, have been in court and, and processed in the UK for uh, hidden debts and, and for corruption on sort of a predatory lending uh, case. Uh, but uh, it's normally the, the lenders who use uh, these, uh, these tools against uh, the, the borrowers. Um, and on, on separate government financing on, on private uh, financing, I, I don't really know what, it, what the growth means, but I think one of the things is, one of the requests from the debt movement is to have a, a broader transparency, a full transparency on, on debt issues. So more than uh, hold separate, uh, we should have full detail of what is on their government financing, but especially on their private financing, who owes to whom, 
who holds a country's debt. When, when, a, when a country that, uh, as Patricia explained before, uh, issues uh, debt in, in the financial markets as, as bond issuing, and these bonds are resell, resold in the, in the secondary markets, the government who issued those bonds can be found in a situation where they don't know who holds their debt. Who is holding that debt? Who do they owe that debt to? And, uh, and that is a problem in, ter in terms of uh, negotiating uh, restructuring or cancellations. So uh, a public um, registry of, uh, of debt would be something we could be uh, calling for. Uh, and, and to wrap up, I think uh, we need to, to work together from the feminist and the debt movement uh, because uh, the debt movement needs the feminist movement in order to make better proposals and to, to advance in, in, in our work. And I think uh, from the debt movement, we have done uh, a lot of work in the past that could also uh, have a, an added value to the, to the, to the feminist uh, movement. So a coalition here is, is mostly needed in the times that uh, come ahead. And uh, one of the processes that, uh, that I think have been uh, in the past uh, powerful in terms of joining the efforts are the idea of debt audits and, and the idea of analyzing debt together from the financial point of view, but also from uh, the human, social, environmental and gender uh, point of view. I think this uh, open dialogue among feminists and development finance group on the debt sustainability uh, concept, on a feminist responsible lending and borrowing, on a feminist rating agency. I, I'm still going on <laughs> with, this, with this idea. Uh, it's, it, it's all together a, a very good way to go and I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you so much, Yolanda. Patricia, your final remarks, comments, hashtag. Thank you, thank you, Emilia. Well, I need to think in a hashtag that, that works also for for Latin America and in Spanish. Um, well, I, I was thinking on this question about public and, and private. I would like to, to think more on private financing and to put on the table more risks that this involves. Is the most is among the most expensive sources of financing for any country. Is is fast, um, and countries can basically use on whatever uh, budget item they want to but it's the most expensive and it's really very uh, complex to think of, or of a, a renegotiation of this because as, as has been mentioned, we don't know who, do we, uh, who are the owners of these bonds. And to increase the problem is not only at national levels. In the last years and it, in many countries in Latin America, uh, Mexico, Brazil and, and others are, um, uh, state-owned enterprises are issuing bonds that are owned by external but foreign investors, as well as uh, subnational uh, governments. So it's not at national uh, levels. So the the risk increases more, and the, the the burden on the debt increases more with all the the impacts that we have already discussed before and and um and there's no enough information so it's very hard to assess what's the size of this uh risk and i would like also to put some other issue on the table which is the debt the external debt of, of the private sector which is the corporate debt and this is part of the lessons learned from the last financial crisis as someone was asking because uh, there, the, the, the public sector rescued the, the, the private sector, and that involved to add more uh, a, a heavy burden on the debt service for the public sector, of course, undermining social investment, social protections, and uh, having gender impacts and, women, uh, and human rights as well. And nobody right now in this crisis is, is talking too much about this debt. And in the case of, the, of Latin America, the level of this debt, this corporate debt, is almost at is almost the same size, uh, has been raising a lot in the last year, and is almost the same size as the public debt, external debt. And right now, it, no, nobody is paying that much attention to this. 
So I think that it, it's also something, uh, 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 an important issue because of the impacts that we know it could have in our countries. And to, to close, I would uh, say and, and agree with what Yolanda mentioned about we need to, to put this more on the table. What is the relation, what are the impacts of the current uh, policies on gender? It's, it's not only debt that we are addressing now, it's the whole uh, unequal system, economic and financial system, that uh, this is our chance to make any change in it. If uh, under this multiple crisis, we cannot put on the table our most ambitious proposals, I don't know when would it be the, the, the opportunity. And it's, uh, and it's important for us to keep putting uh, on the table that, um, and I'm, I'm taking this from a, a feminist in Latin America that says uh, economic, e economics is not uh, gender neutral. Actually, it is the economics uh, the economic and financial policies are blind to gender and we need to remove that from uh, many people's eyes to uh, eliminate that blindness because there is a huge impact and I think that this crisis is showing the, these inequalities more than ever. So uh, that, that's, that's to close and uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much for uh, our speakers. It was brilliant. And thank you so much for reminding us that there will be no solution to that if, if it's not feminist and that the type of, to act is now, is not, if not now, when. So thank you so much for these uh, two main messages. We ran out of time. I just wanted to say uh, we have a lot of things to, to keep on working. So the invitation would be if you want to keep on working closely with us, do send us an email to Rosa Lizarde or myself. Our emails are in the invitations that we sent around on asking that you want to join the Women's Working Group. What is your name, your organizations, and the reason you would like to, to join the Women's Working Group. We will be sending out the links on a YouTube channel so that you can listen to this and watch this webinar again, and also to listen to the recording of our first webinar. Uh, stay tuned to our next webinar next week with the Third World Network on trade and intellectual property rights on, on health and food systems now that we have the pandemic and the threat of an upcoming famine. So uh, thank you so much. We look forward to keep on engaging with you. And as Patricia announced, we are also working on a Spanish uh, webinar on the Latin American region and hopefully later on on other regions. But on the for the time being, six months, six minutes past the, the limit. I thank you both. I thank the audience. Thank you so much for the for those who were helping us with the um, uh, translation and the interpretation. And uh, looking forward to, to seeing you next next week. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.